But as I see what has happened nationally, very nationally, in terms of, of the cases, whether it's in Ferguson, South Carolina, New York, Tennessee, uh, or, or uh, Oklahoma, and from more recently in Baltimore, I will tell you that the world has kind of wakened up to these cases. But once you know that it's not new, that these cases have been going on and on and on for a number of years, I've had every one of the cases that you have now seen very recently in the news, whether it's Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Bell, you know, Freddie Gray, a man out in South Carolina. I have literally had one or more of those cases in my office. I have at least three cases now where young men, young boys were running from the police and were shot in the back. I tried and killed. And I've tried to get the DAs in all those jurisdictions to prosecute. I've sent letters to the Justice Department. Nothing has happened. But now that we have video cameras, it is more likely than not that we're going to have more efforts in prosecuting police officers engaged in this conduct. The Oxford Grand case, which I was involved in, we had a, we had a video camera. We had, I said, we had numerous cell phone cameras, <laughs> which is really the way it's going to be in the future. I'm sure we're going to have police officers that are going to have cameras. We're going to have everybody else with a, with a camera as well. And they're all going to be citizen journalists, if you will. And, and that will, in my view, will have a major impact on curtailing the conduct of police officers. It was mentioned about this case that I've been involved in for a number of years, the Riders case in Oakland. It is really what a law firm can do in order to bring about change in a, in a local police agency. Now, it may be that Oakland was a mid-sized department and thus allowed two lawyers like myself, Jim Channon and myself, to engage in this process. But we certainly were able, once we represented 120 people in this case, was ultimately to really take a look at a department and bring about sort of reform within that department. And, and we've done that over a number of years. Unfortunately, reform is not as easy as one might think. It's a beautiful word, but it does not happen overnight. We've been involved in this case now since 2003 in terms of the consent decree that we enforced. And, and, and where we are now, though, is that we are seeing real progress. We have now instituted the video cameras uh, in the department. We're now taking a look at uh, racial profiling, which is a huge, huge issue for me, because we all know that if you stop people randomly and you ultimately treat them in a disrespectful way, that that could result in arrest of that person and wind that person up in the criminal justice system and their life could change directions for, from then on. But one of the things that we've looked at very closely is the whole question of discipline within the department. And it's, it's a huge issue because once we got into this case, there were officers who were complaining that people were treated differently. If you're black, if you're white, you were a part of a certain clique, if you had the right sergeant, then your discipline for misconduct would not be anything, or it could be more than what other officers had. And so we have fought aggressively in terms of rewriting the policy to get some form of consistency in the discipline that the department can impose upon uh, its officers. We have found it to be a real, real struggle. But it is an area that, that we've worked very hard on early warning system, you would all think that you might have that. But I'm going to tell you, everybody doesn't have it. And if you're looking at a, if you're trying to, in a task force, you're trying to determine how you can monitor the police, you may want to talk to them to find out what kind of early warning system that they have in place. Because the early warning system allows the department to know, and for you to know, whether or not that officer has a, a history of engaging in police misconduct. We, what we found in our case that, look, and things that were very important, that there were a number of times that these particular officers, known as the riders, would in fact arrest people with one rock, uh, one little small rock, a little 10 cent rock. And I would say, wait a minute, I can't imagine a dope dealer walking around with one little rock. One, I, I can't imagine that. Well, it turns out those were ruses. It, it was a pretext. And often they were planted. And, and so the issue is, you want to look for patterns. and so. Part of what you want is to make sure the department is recording these complaints and, and, and someone is looking at the statistical data. You can, as a matter of course, in your own city, find out how many 148 resisting arrests have, you, have been made. How many resisting arrests do you have that's a 243, which is an assault on a police officer? I have found, not only in, in one city, but most cities, these, these 
Illegal arrests, uh, resisting arrests, are often accompanied with a 243, which is an assault on a police officer. These are frankly covered charges. I want you to understand that. These are not legitimate arrests. These are covers. And what happens in these cases is the DA supports it. When the district attorney sanctioned it by charging a person with a 148, 243, that DA knows full well that there wasn't an underlying criminal case that was there. And so from you, from a task force point of view, you may want to, may want to ask questions about that. Or you want to find out what kind of arrests are being made where it looks like there was no, that it was generated by the officer. We often call these attitude type cases. Now, we all talk a lot and we see the major, major cases that occur. The shooting cases obviously get a lot of attention. I was up here when Andy Lopez was shot and killed and, and walked with many of you then. But we have, I've had many, since, since, Oscar, since Michael Brown's case, I've had six shooting cases around the bay. Six, mind you. Four of those cases were unarmed men who were running away. And that issue never stops. But the real negative aspect of policing that you should all be mindful of is the day in, day out policing that you never see. It's the young man that's walking down the street, the teenage boy that's walking down the street and he gets stopped and he gets hassled. The, the Reginald Gray, the, 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 the uh, Brown kid, Freddie Brown, Freddie Gray. That case is so symbolic of what goes on every day. Because what happened? Freddie is running, walking down the street, he sees the police off, he takes off running. He had not committed a crime. It is not a crime. The police had no information at all that he had committed a crime. But what happens? 45 minutes later, he is dead. If the police had not tried to stop him, there never would have been an incident. Now, what the police would call themselves doing is proactive. Well, I have found down through the years that that really is, we don't really know. Let's just find out. Let's just find out. Let's just find out what's going on. I had a case, one of the more notorious cases, where I had four young, four African-American men in a car. And they were driving down the street. Two of them had, one of them had been on parole. The other three people were not. They just had breakfast. The police officer looks up, sees him, says something to the effect, I wonder what. They stop these young men, pull them out of the car, and then they ultimately pull, had to pull their pants down and they searched their private parts. Egregious conduct. But the most significant thing is that they shouldn't have been stopped in the first place. Now, I ultimately had to sue the department, the officers, not only around the issue of the stop, but I had also sued around the issue of having people pull their pants down and searching for drugs when you have not probable cause to do it. Now, well, fortunately, I had a very good judge, and when Aaron, my good friend, would know this, Marilyn Mattel, uh, she was our judge. And so we had the policy declared unconstitutional because it was just fundamentally wrong. But, those, but if I hadn't been able to do that, I represented, after that case, I represented over 45 young men who had their pants pulled down and who had put, been humiliated by officers who were modern day ministers, as far as I was concerned. And, and, and so it was something that I was able to do once I saw what was happening. But the point I want to make is that the vast majority of this kind of conduct that is illegal and that is destructive to the community, the destructive to police community relationship, is the daily contact where people are hassled, people are treated wrongfully, they're thrown up against a car, and more importantly, their cars and things are searched. One of the big things that we've been working on very strongly in Oakland, and it's an issue that, very, that has had nationwide discussion once upon a time, that's the issue of racial profiling. Well, part of, part of our settlement that we engaged in with the Riders case was to require that the officers on every stop had to fill out what they call a stop data card. That stop data card was that you had to give the name, the race, the sex, the basis for the stop, and whether you searched that car. And you know, the object is to determine if you had all this data, can you evaluate this, this, this data, determine whether there's patterns, to determine who's getting stopped and why. And ultimately what that data showed, clearly, if not to anyone's surprise, was that African Americans were being stopped at a disproportionately higher rate than other ethnic groups. They not only were they being stopped, they were being searched at a disproportionately higher rate than other groups, but the most interesting data of all 
they were not finding any contraband or drugs at a higher rate than any other ethnic groups. Which meant that a huge number of people were being stopped wrongfully and they having their cars searched. Now I understand when I talk to young people about it, is that I, you got to know that the real objective here is for the police to get into your car. They want to search your car. You have a right to say no. You may say no at your own peril, but you do have a right to say no. But it is hopeful now, as we work through this case, and we're talking about bringing about change, is that we've hired now a, a psychologist from Stanford, a, a, a MacArthur uh, genius, if you will, and literally. And she is looking at our data to see if we can evaluate where again the trouble is in terms of what officers are doing, who are making stops, whether or not it's systemic to a particular squad, but we've actually gotten down to the point where we know on a squad who makes what searches, who makes what stops and what searches. And, and so we're sort of nailing it down. And so the object is to see if we can identify those officers who seem to have a disproportionate high number of stops in African American communities, why they have these stops, and to figure out whether or not there is something that they are doing that is different than other people who don't have these stops. It is a very interesting approach. It is our sense, though, that if we can get to this issue, we can make the citizens, make people in the community feel a whole lot safer and that they will not get stopped. We are not in the business of trying to stop police officers from fighting crime. Not, that's not my deal. You know, I'm, I'm from law enforcement. I live in the city. You know, I, I got grandkids and, 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 uh, and, and friends who have kids and nieces and nephews. I want them to be safe as well as anyone else. On the other hand, I don't want people abused. And I don't want people to be in stock. And I don't want the kind of tension that we all see now in terms of the police. And you asked me, and I uh, listened uh, here uh, to the comments that have been made here. And I, I thought about a uh, big man and uh, the comments around the Black Panther Party and what that meant. And even though the legacy of the Black Panther Party to me is the fact that they were the first to call attention to the police abuse in the open community. And that abuse extended to other communities as well. I ultimately went to Chicago and became very much immersed in understanding police abuse and that's it. Now this is a time when I was doing this when the Civil Rights Movement in the South had taken place and you could see the abuse by the law enforcement and the dogs, but you didn't really know that it was a northern problem as well. And so when I got to Chicago and I saw what was happening there and I ultimately came back to Oakland and, and so it became a way for me to appreciate that there is a lane, there is a level of misconduct that's taking place that I could do something about it that I can participate in moving and changing the social dynamics that exist in, in this area. And I've been very fortunate to do that. In some of the cases you've had made um, great reference to, I've, I've been involved in those cases and it's been an honor to be in a position uh, to affect uh, the lives of people who have been abused, but also to hold cities accountable uh, and, and to let them know, as I would say, you might be able to do it, but you gotta come through me to get it done. And, and that's been very important. And I, and, I, and I think about, years ago I represented, I guess a long time now, I represented a six-year-old boy. Six-year-old boy who had been accused of attempted murder. And I was, the community came to me and asked me would I represent him because they had this view that this six-year-old boy was being railroaded. He was being charged with attempted murder who was being placed in the juvenile justice system and the, as a delinquent. And, and so I got involved in the case, I was so angry about it. I knew at the time that other young white kids, six to eight to 10, had also either killed someone or seriously injured someone, and they would not put it in the juvenile justice system. They would not. They would put it in social services. And so I had to fight for a period of time to get justice for that young boy. The funny part of that young, that kid, he was so young, he didn't even know who I was. He just, he just knew I was a tall guy who came to the courtroom. But it was, it was important, it was important because you want to make sure as you practice the law that there are standards. That those standards, as much as you can make them, apply equally across the board. 
There's no question about racism that exists within the criminal justice system. I have railed against those matters for a long time. But when I saw this six-year-old boy, I, I was really taken aback that anyone would even want to say that the six-year-old boy should be treated differently than anyone else. And I was able to be, be successful in that case, me and my, my team at the time. And I got great rewards from that particular case, even though he didn't know who I was, you know. But it also set a standard that you cannot step outside of the line to treat a black kid differently than a white kid if you can do something about it. And so I'm very pleased about that. And I've been able to do that in many, many cases as practicing law. And so, you know, when talks about the various lane, uh, lanes that you have, and you can define that lane for yourself. As I listen to what has been said here, I can see that many here in this community, and certainly it makes sense to say CLU, feel very strongly about moving the social agenda, improving the social progress in the particular community in which you live. There's a lot to be done. And you know, I'm very much moved by the various protests that are taking place around the, around the country. I did an, did an interview yesterday, uh, two days ago, with NBC News around the Baltimore case. My first reaction to the reporter was, stunning. It was stunning because it just doesn't happen often. In the Oscar Grant case, we were able to get a, 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 a criminal prosecution, but it also took protests and violent activity and an out, outpouring of support so that, that the DA himself couldn't take the pressure. Well, that's what it takes. Lawyers can do certain things, but the community at large can do a whole lot more. And in the community at large can bring the real pressure. Lawyers are kind of restrained by the process in which they have to work in. There's no question lawyers can do very good work in moving the social agenda. But the community at large really is the one, if organized, can make things happen. And so I have no doubt that but for the social outpouring and unrest that took place in Baltimore basically caused that prosecutor to move very, very quickly. And that was a very good thing because in many of these investigations take place, they claim they take months and months to do. That's just not true. I mean, you know very early what a case is. And, and they do. I mean, these are smart people as well. They know if they want to make a case, they can make the case. And, and they don't. The, the case of South Carolina went by very quickly. Again, there was a book, there was a video. And I, and I think we'll see probably more of that. That doesn't mean, because I haven't seen it, that there will be convictions at a high level. There'll be more convictions than video cameras, and I think that everybody should have a video camera if they can have one. I'm a firm believer in that. And, and, and certainly in Oakland, as an example, we, we uh, got video cameras a while, a while ago, or over the last 18 months. We've been seeing that the beating cases, the, the, uh, the, the cases have gone down in terms of use of force. The claims have gone down, the shootings have gone down, and now we're making real progress in some other areas. And so it can be done, uh, you know, and that I would say to any of you who, particularly those who work on the task force, you should continue that work. Because if anything I would say about what we have done, it was always better if we had community support that sort of understands the issues that you're involved in. And even though they may not participate in the lawsuit itself, if the community itself is behind you, and the police chief, and the mayor, and the public officials are aware of it as well, they're more inclined to understand the issues and make some progress. Because obviously courts can make them do certain things, but it's much better politically if the voters in the community have to put the pressure on the community for them to make it. So let me just say, finally, in here, that you know, I'm honored that you asked me to speak uh, to you. Uh, it's always important to me uh, to go into communities and see the good work that they're doing, and, and to let them understand the kind of work that can be done uh, as lawyers, uh, such as myself, in individual cases. So uh, again, thank you, and I appreciate uh, uh, being acknowledged to come here to speak. Thank you.